Thank you all for being here. I'm so happy to be on this panel with these really amazing minds and also um, have so many connections between all of our projects. Uh, so the work I'll be speaking on is a long running uh, project that's been spanning for almost 10 years now. Um, it's called Blacklisted, a, Plant a Planted Allegory. And um, I have been, uh, it all kicked off originally with the um, first thing of just even thinking about what is this thing called a weed? Uh, why is one plant a weed and what another plant not a weed? And um, this uh, quote here, I think really sums it up nicely. A plant that interferes with management objectives for a given area of, given area of land at a given point in time. Uh, very anthropocentric, <laughs> very human centric uh, point of view about where these plants ought to be when they when they ought not to be somewhere um so i should also explain why i am even interested in that topic to begin with um i am i am a refugee my family were refugees um when they emigrated to the u.s and were given asylum i was actually uh born on the way and so i was born stateless um and so growing up here i've always you know had this uh um knowledge that it's it's in a way very lucky that we were uh, allowed that opportunity. Um, I also spent 11 years of my life living in Sweden, um, not very far away from uh, where Carl Linnaeus had his uh, laboratory garden. Um, and I lived in the forest uh, for five years of that time, so very close to plants, uh, getting to spend the time that it takes to observe um, their, day, their growth, the seasons, um, how they track our movements, and it's a reciprocal response. So uh, this knowledge was slowly building in time in me. Um, and uh, then I came across something called a blacklist. Uh, and a blacklist is a way of determining certain plants that are, and I'm going to be using the blacklist language, so if you hear me using sort of um, incendiary terms, just know it comes from a, a source, and that's not me. Um, so these are alien invasive plants. Uh, they're noxious weeds. Um, they uh, don't belong. Um, and they, the whole concept is that they have arrived from elsewhere. They've come to, this is, uh, now I'm going to be speaking specifically in California, but there are blacklists that exist for many, many places. Um, and so they've arrived from somewhere else, and the threat is that they're going to take over the landscape and um, eradicate anything that was native. Um, so uh, I felt a little sensitive about this because, um, first of all, what do we determine in what uh, point in time was native? Who is native, especially in a place like California where this uh, this has been named as a succession of different territories and nations have belonged here. Um, but in terms of evolutionary time and certainly geological time, human's presence in the landscape is relatively recent. Um, so when we're saying that certain plants don't belong, I then in doing deeper research into the language behind, it's not only a list, there's also lots of um, text that explains the thoughts behind this. Um, I understood that uh, those aren't, uh, you know, the, the categories and the reasoning for why these plants uh, got on this list. And when that list is enforced, it's not theoretical, it's actually a list of action. So all these plants are meant to be terminated upon site, um, in theory, uh, except that if these plants offer an, um, a value to humans in terms of either agriculture um, so they can still be invasive, but if they're agriculturally valuable, they can be given an exception. If they're monetarily valuable, like in terms of tourist value, in the case of the palm tree, um, they can also be given an exception in certain locations. So it became problematic. When does this get enforced and how does it get enforced and who is being determined as being okay as an invader and who is not okay as an invader? Um, so. I felt like I had to step back and actually do this research myself. Um, I'm not a trained botanist, but I was going to make it happen. And actually, this happened uh, thanks to Kira Ennis. Uh, I got to come to the, the Pitzer College, and I used all the Claremont Colleges as my site. 
um, 600 plants in a list that looked like this is uh, the California blacklist. So um, I just set myself up 30 days. I'm going to go deep and hard <laughs> and see what I come up with, how many of those plants I can find on those campuses. Uh, those campuses ended up being an excellent place to do this research because the first one, Pomona College, was founded in 1892. Pretty shortly after, this place called California was named as such. Um, and I set myself up as the collector. Uh, whenever you're adding to an herbarium, um, the people who add the plant specimens to the herbarium are called collectors. They're identified as such, so I became the collector. Um, and what I was doing actually was trying to provide asylum for all of these plants that I found on the list um, and offer them a sort of panacea space in terms of I'll host you, I'll provide this respite for you, but also uh, if you happen to not be part of that list, then um, you don't get that benefit. So, uh, you know, kind of putting myself in the, the zone of being the one who determines um, that yes, you get to be uh, protected or not protected. Um, I did this work not only on my own, but I had the benefit of, of doing these plant walks with uh, 50 experts uh, who were everything from restoration ecologists to native plant specialists. And you saw one of them earlier, that was Naomi, Naomi Fraga, who specializes in native orchids here in California, and um, talked with all of them about sort of what was their own position in relationship to this idea of blacklisting. They're all scientists, so they think about it, um, and especially for restoration ecologists. Uh, and they said that it is difficult because creating a list like that means that you're breaking everything up into a very black and white either or categorization. And unfortunately, um, biomes don't work that way. Nature is a system. Um, and uh, especially the inclusion of so many of us and our needs as humans um, in this environment, specifically uh, industrialized agriculture that relies on um, European honeybees to pollinate all of those plants, uh, means that the system doesn't match whatever would have uh, been the evolutionary sort of um, result of uh, plants that had been here for many, many millennia. Um, now we have all sorts of other pressures and needs, and especially in an urban environment, um, there's a whole different nitrogen content, there's a different kind of soil that's here, and a different kind of compaction than what you might find if you went up into the mountains and uh, plants that had a sort of environment that they were used to if you're talking about native plants. Um, and making those conclusions that they ought to be the only ones belonging here. Unfortunately, we've created a whole different system now. So um, I'm not saying honestly with this project, one thing is better or worse. I'm actually just trying to identify what is currently. And um, so I just want to show you what this process was like. This is actually uh, three different um, thistles. And so this is how uh, specific the uh, form of identifications need to be to determine um, if these plants were even there and if they deserved um, being included in my own uh, miniature blacklist. Um, and so I, this is what the process of asylum looked like. Um, so I would replant them inside the studio, which was the gallery over at uh, Pitzer College, um, providing them with the best I could, which was grow lights, uh, it was uh, soil, but asylum is not a perfect solution for anyone, any um, thing. And I don't consider plants a thing. I'm just uh, saying um, any, any, uh, species, uh, it's a difficult thing to ask uh, to move from one location to another. Um, that's not your home. Uh, so in that process, uh, some of the plants did better than others. And um, what I was actually doing was capturing uh, their ability to survive this move. Um, in those 30 days, uh, I was capturing a single image of their shadows projected onto the scrim once a day. And uh, all of those images together um, made this composite image um, that I then uh, projected uh, at full size within the gallery. And you could walk around this projection and your own shadow um, became part of the image. And this was shown once again um, over at uh, the Los Angeles Arboretum with Shirley Watts. Uh, she's in the audience. Um, <laughs> so this image comes from there. Um, and uh, 
actually the Los Angeles Arboretum and even the Huntington are really interesting places to think about in terms of how much singular people have shaped this environment that we uh, think uh, on some level as natural here in Los Angeles, but uh, as described so well by both of our earlier presenters, um, what we're seeing is a trace of colonial history. We're seeing a trace of um, multi uh, waves of ethnic migration um, in terms of the need for labor for building the railroad. So, so many um, immigrants from China. Um, but many people in different uh, periods in California's history have been bringing plants with them as reflections of home. So that would be kitchen garden plants, uh, things that are used medicinally, um, things that uh, provide um, uh, all sorts of selves, whether they be aesthetic or uh, something that you need for home or food or um, otherwise. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just collecting my thoughts here. This is a lot to pack in into a short <laughs> talk. Um, but uh, I wanted to present this information and sort of critique the way that um, even the names of the plants have a, um, a history embedded in them. And as I mentioned, I was uh, living not very far away from where Carl, Carl Linnaeus, who developed the Systema Natura, uh, the whole taxonomic system for how we think about all species and their relationship to each other. Um, I wanted to go deep into the system so that I could critique it from within. And so I had to learn the language of a botanist and uh, then insert myself into the herbarium over at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden um, and uh, be able to use their herbarium, this place where all these plants have been stored. Um, some uh, pieces in the, some plants in this collection are over 100 years old, so it's quite deep. Um, there are 10 million plants in that collection, and um, what I wanted to do is actually represent re uh, these plants uh, now in my own collection, these 133, which you could see as both totally local, because they all came from here, um, but highly foreign in the sense that they're all originally from elsewhere. Um, and uh, in organizing them in the way you would find them in an herbarium, they're organized by family. So you could start to see phenotypes, uh, ways that we identify them, um, whether it's by leaf type or um, uh, sex type. Uh, and what I was doing is I was actually making these um, cutouts, these silhouette cutouts uh, out of paper, hand cut. And I also created the cabinet as well to mimic uh, the way you might see it presented in a 17th century or 18th century style um, music, museological display. Um, but everything I was presenting, all the materials, it's made out of MDF and hardboard and paper, um, things that will degrade over time. So basically critiquing that system by the materials uh, not being um, something that will last forever. Um, so what you're seeing, uh, these are detail shots of those paper cutouts. Um, and uh, here we have the original plant. So you can see um, sort of the research and sort of where it ended up in the creation. Um, the reason for using silhouettes is that uh, this predates photography as far as the way of um, usually creating portraits of people. And um, in Sweden where I was living, uh, literally 30 minutes away from me. That was the uh, also the site of um, studying eugenics and creating this uh, institute for race um, uh, sort of uh, supremacy. Um, so that started in Sweden and it was also like a big um, influence for uh, the Nazi regime um, in terms of what they were thinking about and also uh, defining the Aryan race as being, you know, the ultimate. So, um, so I'm just taking you through some of these plants again. And there were lots of really amazing discoveries along the way in terms of um, uh, not only just plants being um, evident in the collection, uh, but also information. So pressed alongside uh, the Kikuyu grass, which originates from Africa and um, similar to Devil's Grass as being its name, um, is there this uh, article from 1936 saying giant grass menace to be hit um, in this battle over the weed. Uh, and thinking about 1936 and where this plant comes from, um, a lot of instances like this kept coming up where the subtext can't be ignored um, in terms of who is being represented by what. 
Uh, so there were a number of works in this project, and I'm just taking you through some of the images so that you can see. Not enough time to describe everything, but um, I have gone to, I have been fortunate to go to many different institutions and study um, the way plants have been presented to us um, and this amazing collection uh, that is at Harvard, uh, the Natural History Museum there. Um, these are all glass models of plants. Um, and they were made by a father and son named the Blaschkas. And I was really interested because uh, the son um, had actually traveled through California in the late 1800s um, with the mission of uh, rendering all these plants first uh, in his sketchbook and then going back home to Dresden, Germany, where he and his father had been commissioned to recreate lifelike models of the plants from around the US actually um, in glass. Uh, and the reason for this is again, it's pre-photography, so a way for the botany students to um, see and study these plants uh, in full relief in three dimensions and also um, magnifications of uh, different parts of the plants. And I wondered if, if let's say, um, all comes true with the blacklist and all the native plants of California disappear, um, might it be only in a collection like this where we could encounter um, true to life representations of them? So uh, what I did is after uh, being allowed to come in and photograph these myself, um, I actually created my own models of uh, those plaster bases that those plants um, re rest on. So you'll see the white, that's a plaster base, and it has this amazing pink residue from it being cast. Um, and I recreated those in glass. Um, so now what you're looking at uh, within the vitrine that I made also out of MDF, because this could disappear too, um, are uh, these glass impressions of uh, those plants. Um, and uh, I've also screen printed the original um, labels as well. So um, everything is a shadow of its former self. Um, mm. I'm feeling like I'm running out of time. <laughs> Um, but I uh, just wanted to say that, so these were all sort of uh, ways of um, using the scientific modes of uh, display and critiquing those um, from within. And uh, I felt that it was really important to have the voice of these plants actually present within the whole project. So I, it took several years um, just focused on this part alone, but I wrote a book um, from the perspective of each of these plants in this collection. So there are 133 stories um, in the voice of each plant. Uh, on behalf of not only itself, but also as a vehicle for uh, the migrant of whom it might represent. And I wanted um, to write a, plant, a story on behalf of each plant um, and through its voice um, because I felt that a range of experiences needed to be represented through this. There's not just one migratory experience. Um, and so in the span of 133 chances, I was hoping to um, give the full breadth of what that experience might be. And lest all of these be uh, really removed representations of plants, I also created these small totems that accompanied 15 copies of the book. Um, these are all plants of the blacklist that I made these um, small weavings of. They're only about three by six. Um, so they're using um, uh, traditional weaving techniques from around the world. I, to write the book, I was actually uh, three months in Japan, um, uh, sitting at a table, contemplating a lot of the plants that originated from Asia as well, um, getting to see them in their own um, space, uh, but also uh, taking um, these last few years to observe all of these different traditions and interpret them in my own way and let all these plants meet together in this sort of space. So. I think I'll end on that. <laughs>